interesting thing about an objective truth is that it's true no matter what. Imagine that. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. We've been waiting on you. We're ready to get back into the three world ages. You know, it takes a great deal sometimes to descramble. You know, the scrambler is quite a thing anymore, but it takes a great deal sometimes to unscramble or descramble input into your mind over a period of years from would be. Bible teachers, Sunday school teachers, or what have you, and they're well-meaning, bless their hearts, we love them. But it can sure make fools out of Christians when you must on your faith stand and say this earth is only 6,000 years old when God's Word declares it, but yet some Bible thumper has you declaring that and, and the, the scientific community snickers, and it's no wonder that they do. They should. Because only a fool would make a statement like that. Because God's Word in itself, through Peter's teachings that we covered in the last lecture, the three earth ages, we're going to complete this lecture on the three world ages because it's really not that complicated when you listen to your Father's Word rather than man. I'm going to teach you in the second verse we read a Hebrew word. I don't want you to ever forget it. It's important. And... Where do you go to get the truth? The beginning. What does the word beginning mean? Genesis. So go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. May we ask a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name as we go into his word. Bearing in mind the words of Peter, listen how it tells right here in the first two verses a span of history that is eons. Millions of years. Listen to it. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. Now, when did it say he did that? It didn't. It said, in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth, period. It doesn't say there's no time involved in that other than the beginning. Now when was that beginning? And after he created the heaven and the earth and to be inhabited, what happened to it? You know of Satan's rebellion. You know of the great shaking before even the foundations of this earth. Now listen to this second verse. Even in the English, listen to it. Verse 2, And the earth was without form and void. Underline the word void. I'm going to give it to you in the Hebrew, and I don't want you to ever forget it. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God had moved on it before this. The word void, tuhu, in the Hebrew tongue, means absolutely, utterly, completely, waste, void, destroyed. So what does it really say here? It says that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, period. There was an entire age in that first verse. And then if you were to translate the word was, became, you would have it. And the earth became void and without form. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Why? Because God destroyed that earth age. There was a time before this destruction that all of the children of God sang and were happy. They were joyful. It's written in the 8th chapter of Proverbs in another place we will study before we complete this lecture in this setting. And then unhappiness came on the scene. Sorrow greed on Satan's part. It's written in Ezekiel 28. It's just that people will not listen to our Father's word. They listen to men. And dark clouds did form on the horizon as Satan, who is called Tyre in that chapter, meaning rock, not our rock, the fake. He began to try to take over the mercy seat, which was reserved for Messiah. 
and he himself was condemned to death. So death did not enter this earth with Abel. Death did not enter this earth with Adam and Eve's sin. Death entered this earth with Satan in the world that was. Now, true enough, death entered this earth age. But you, you've got to realize there is a difference when you say this earth and then put perimeters there, parameters, and focus only on this particular age. That's what's wrong with most Christians. That's why that we have evolution taught in our schools because Christians are not wise enough to really understand the creation and scientifically you can document the fact that this earth is millions of years old. We do it in our own documentaries with the dinosaur tracks and so forth. But God's word declares it as eons old as well. It's just that Christians just seem to be a little bit slow. Why? They allow the ministry to place those parameters at the beginning of this earth age and the end of this earth age and that's all they can see. They can't see past that. They can't see before it or after it, even in the prophecy, because they have not been taught. Now God goes into a great deal of, uh, of um, He goes into a great detail as to how He destroyed the earth, and it's well written in Jeremiah chapter four. Let's go right there. Jeremiah chapter four. We're going to move around a little bit in this lecture, but be that as it may. If you listen, allow your mind to be washed clean rather than brainwashed, all right? Let it be washed clean with the truth from God's Word, from those things that have been instilled within you. What's happening here in Jeremiah chapter 4? Well, here in Jeremiah chapter 4, God is giving Israel a great warning. He's t telling you, in one case, how you should break up your fallow ground to plant seeds, and those seeds happen to be flesh man, for one. The Passover tapes this year will lead into that. Those of you that have studied them will know and understand what I mean. But he said, if you mess around, I'm gonna, if you don't think I will destroy this earth age, look what I did to the last one. That's what he's talking about. So here you have a first-hand account not from man, but from God himself as to how he brought about the destruction of the earth age that was. You read here how the earth came to be void and without form. It wasn't that way always. The, uh, let, me, let me go to a little data for you. The fact on the documentary we made in the panhandle of Oklahoma in the edge of Colorado, the fact that there were rich legumes at one time, almost swampland with the very dinos the dinosaur tracks millions of years before, letting you know that this earth was not void and without form past that 6,000 years ago, but that it became that way. Those dinosaurs and that rich legume that even brings about and brings forth the oil that you and, and fuel that you burn in your automobile did not happen 6,000 years ago, nor did it happen underneath uh, water. That is to say, an earth covered with water and void of anything. The dinosaurs were there. They are something. So you see, there's a great hole in what man would teach you that this earth is 6,000 years old. Be realistic. Christianity is a reality. So face it. It's not a religion. It's a reality. And understanding our Father's Word is a reality also. Listen to Him and you'll learn. So He's telling them, if you were, listen, if you don't think I destroyed it once before, listen to me. Let's pick it up, if we may, in verse uh, 19. My bowels, my bowels, my within, my within, or my heart, my heart, if you like. I am pained at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. 
And those of you in a prophetic sense, if you look all the way to the end, you understand when this next destruction comes in part. Verse 20. Destruction. Yes, at the seventh trump. Destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tent spoiled and my curtains in a moment. In other words, it's going to happen again in an instant like that. A moment. When? when Christ's feet touched the Mount of Olives. And now he's going to tell you how it happened in the past. Listen carefully. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? The standard, of course, is Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. He is the living word, and the word is your standard. Verse 22. For my people is foolish. What, a, what an understatement, quite frankly, when you think in the terms of what he's trying to communicate to you. My people are foolish. They stand up in a court of law when the evolution, the monkey law, comes forth, and they don't have any more sense than to say this earth is 6,000 years old. They have not known me. Why have they not known God? Because this is his word, and they don't know that word. They are sottish children. Do you know what the word sottish? They, the translators of the King James were very kind. It means stupid in the Hebrew. They are stupid children. And that, that explains it more to our liking and the truth. And they have none understanding. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. It seems like they can pollute everything that is in the natural. They can destroy this earth with their poisons and their habits. But to do good, they have no knowledge. No, none at all. And when the children are so sottish that they can't understand the three earth ages, which are so simply put forth from God's word, it's real sad, dear friend. I could weep for our people because of the standard and level of teaching that is put forth to them in this generation. High technology explodes in this generation. We've placed men on the moon. But what about theology? Where is it? Has it exploded? Verse 23, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. There it is. You understand? I told you to remember that word. Tuhu vabuhu. I beheld the earth after that, and it became, it was void and without form in the heavens, and they had no light. I looked after I got through shaking them. And both the heavens and the earth were void and without light. 24. Listen to the destruction after the fall of Satan. From your father's own lips. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled. And all the hills moved lightly. Our father hang this earth in the socket that it fits. It is believed by many that are familiar with the plates of this great earth's crust and service, surface that all continents were one at one time and a great shaking caused them to break up. And if you look at the coast of the east coast of the Americas along with the coast on the west of Africa and Europe, you can see how very possibly those crusts and plates meshed at one time, be that as it may. That's beside the point. God is saying, I shook it. 25. I beheld, I looked, I observed, I saw with my own eyes, your father says. And lo, there was no man. Many of you would like to say, well, this is Noah's flood. No man. Do you know what no means? Zilch. Zero. God destroyed in that body every living being. And they were transformed into a new body instantly. 
but he destroyed that earth age, every last man. There were not eight souls floating aboard some ark or other people uh, are uh, alive to, to cater to or to cotton to. No zilch, no man. And all the birds of the heavens are fled. They're destroyed. You have no living bird. What was that that uh, Noah released from the ark? First, it was a raven. There were quite a few birds. He had two of those species aboard. Then a dove, symbolic of peace. This does not have to do with Noah's flood. Listen as we document it. Verse 26, I beheld, this is God again saying, I looked, I saw, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. There was not a tree standing. It was waste. And all, let, let's stop a minute. What was it that the dove went out to retrieve? Did not at a short end of a year that the dove returned with an olive branch? Do you know how long it takes an olive tree to grow? Do you know how long it takes a branch from waste, nothing? Quite frankly, if you want to know the truth about it, there was not even a living seed. God created the seed of the olive tree after this event. Could not have been Noah's flood. You understand? And all the cities thereof. Whoa, what do you know about that, friend? This earth was inhabited with cities at one time before. I'm not talking about the ruins that they find in the Middle East at this time as they go on digs or the mounds of this country. I'm talking about a city that no doubt could have been in a different dimension even. As far as substance is concerned, bear with me. Thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord. What broke them down? Almighty God himself caused them to cease existence. God brought forth a saying that is said in Isaiah, Woe to those that join house unto house. He doesn't like cities. That's why Cain was cursed and became a city dweller and builder. Anytime you start building and joining house unto house, you have murder, rape, crime, and so forth. It extends it when you crowd people together. At the presence of the Lord and by his furious anger. You can understand why that God, when he caused it to simply rain 40 days, he didn't destroy the cities. He did not um, destroy every man for Noah's entire family was aboard the ark. I believe there were people yet in the earth. All God wanted to destroy were the Geber, the giants that were the offspring of woman and the fallen angels, whereby Satan was trying to spoil the woman's seed, whereby the seed of Messiah could not come through woman, else it was part of the serpent's seed. Therefore, Satan still trying to take the mercy seat, if not in the world that was, by hook and crook, and, uh, and uh, deception in this world. Do you understand? That's why that it was so important to him that Cain be born of him. For it was through the woman that Messiah would come through this earth age, that office. He doesn't give up. Let that not be a point of digression whereby you miss the point, but rather a, a compound that will solidify the entire truth overall together for the very controversy is between Christ and Satan. That's why this destruction took place in the beginning. As I have shared with you before, God could have killed a third of his children that followed Satan. But what does it take to cause you to kill one of your own that you love? He, didn't, he chose rather to destroy the age and cause each to be born innocent of woman in the flesh, innocent with all memory of what was erased, I know this may sound strange to some, and no, I'm not talking about reincarnation. Don't be uh, stupid. I'll use the word soddish. Don't be that way. Think. 
Verse 27, For thus, saith, thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. I'm going to read one more verse. You may not even have it on your character generator. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have proposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. It's going to happen. Yet I'll leave that remnant, he stated. Now, was the earth, this is what the point hinges on then. It doesn't, it doesn't hinge on it for the Hebrew scholar. The Hebrew manuscripts are very clear. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth then became void and without form because God shook it, and he gave it a good shaking. He destroyed that that was. And that's why, if you want to know the truth about it, that a freeze came over the land, the whole world at one time, I feel quite possibly that God moved the true orbit, the axis of this earth, 90 miles. That's why I think that the North Pole and the Magnetic Pole are 90 miles apart. And therefore, we have the, the uh, jet stream which forms the weather basically around this globe where at one time it was a perfect climate, both at the North and the South Pole because of our situ situ uh, position. But the earth became void and without form and uninhabitable until God cleansed it and corrected it. Do you remember back when we opened in Psalms 104, God spoke and the waters hasted instantly away that didn't happen in Noah's flood, and God promised he would never destroy this earth again by water. This is the water he's talking about as well as the flood of Noah, but by fire, and he is that consuming fire. So, again, the point rests in your mind in the English. Was the earth created void and without form, or was it created with the mountains standing out of the water to be inhabited? Do you realize it's written? God makes it very clear. I want to go to the, turn back to the book of Isaiah chapter 45 for me. For one verse. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, and let God's word speak for itself. Do not forget the Hebrew word I told you to remember. Tuhu. And the severity of it. Void. Verse 18, Isaiah 45. For thus saith the Lord, who's speaking? Almighty God, Yahweh. The Lord that created the heavens. God himself, himself, that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created, he did what? He created it not in vain. What did that word vain mean? To who? He created it not destroyed. He created it not covered over with black water. Have you got that? Can you understand English? He formed it to be inhabited, not to be wasted, not to be destroyed, Almighty God, your Father, your loving Father, give Him credit. He wouldn't build a wasteland. He created it a beautiful jewel, Mother Earth, to be inhabited. He did not create it to. It became that way. Have you got it? I am the Lord. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. He, he's the God of love. What do you think he is? That he would shake these people and destroy them for no cause. Because they had it coming. It is difficult for a man to think in God's way. It isn't only difficult, it's impossible. But can you let wisdom rise? The most beautiful proverb, the eighth chapter, wisdom said, I was with God from the very beginning before he ever created the earth. I was with him. Wisdom. Can you possess it? Don't be sottish. Listen to his word. 
And there was a case at one time when Job, Job meaning persecuted in a type of God's elect. I want to go to Job. I want to go to Job. The book of Job. I'm going to go to Job 38. And while you're turning there, I'm going to slip back to the first of Job and I want to read something to you. You find 38 Job. I'm going to Job 1 verse 7 just to read it to you. Verse 1, 7 from Job. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And then Satan answered, I'm sorry, verse 6 I want to read. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. You'll find the same thing written in chapter 2, verse 1. Now chapter 38 of the book of Job. 37 chapters of Satan accusing Job before God that Satan can deceive him and turn him against God if God will remove all the defenses of Job. God was so proud of Job even as he is proud of you today. Those that have eyes to see and can understand the simplicity in which his word is written. He said, no you can't Satan. You can't win over Job. I'll take down the fence. And Satan cast boils. The poor man was a, a walking dead man. But he never, never gave up. But his three so-called buddy buddies, they tried to make Job perfect as man will always try to make you. They'll try to make you a real Puritan. They'll try to make you stand up and be a glistening star that never sins. And that's impossible in the flesh. God knows that. But yakety, yakety, yakety. And I've heard ministers teach sermons on these first 37 chapters and said, this is the word from God. It is not. Do you know what God thinks about these 37 chapters? Listen to it and learn from your father's word. 38. Then the Lord answered Job. Finally, God speaks after 37 chapters. Out of the whirlwind and said, what is this whirlwind? Is that highly polished bronze whirling disc that is thrown as a board in Ezekiel. Verse 2, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, 37 chapters, God says, Why are you listening to those idiots? They don't know what they're talking about, Job. Unfortunately, that's the entire lesson of Job and that's why I really won't do the thing, all of it on television. I've got it all on cassette tape. And every Christian should experience it once to receive 37 chapters of junk, of men's words, yakety, yakety, yakety. The same thing you get preached from most pulpits in this nation today. It's an experience that you should enjoy. Well, go through. God says, why do you listen to those idiots? You've always got his word, you know. You could listen to your father. Verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. You gird yourself up and get ready for action and service, and you stand up like a man, Job. Verse 4, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? If you know so much, Job, if you are so wise in your little flesh body with its pea brain, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Stop and think about that one. Where were you? Do you know? Well, I wasn't born yet. Oh, where were you? Verse 5. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? That's a question. Answering. Or who has stretched the line upon it? Who put each star in its place and set the natural law in the order of things? Answering. And naturally, man's got to say, we don't even know how many are really out there, God. And you don't. Six. Upon, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Where are the sockets that hold this earth exactly where it's at and keeps it in that position? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? 
That's all questions. Seven, when the morning stars, listen to me and bear in mind Revelation chapter 12 where Satan drew a third of the stars. That's God's children. It's referring to men. Saying together, I want you to, all the morning stars, the sons of the morning, the sons of God, saying together. There wasn't one bad note in the whole lot. What I'm talking about is harmony and peace of mind. And all, how many? Don't you dare miss that point. All the sons of God shouted for joy. Have you heard all the sons of God? Everyone has shouted for joy recently? No, you've always got some group over here that's got some very sad detail that's very grievous to them. But there was a time when all the sons of God, do you realize that Satan was a son of God? God created him. Ezekiel 28 declares it. He was God's son. He was also one of those that sang with joy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Back in that perfect beginning, before sin entered into that world that was. I'm not talking about this world age. Back when all the sons of God, call them angels if you like, they were simply the souls of people that are inhabit this earth age, passing through one at a time, one time only. Where did your soul come from? It came from God, of course. And you were with Him. All the sons of God, created at the same time, sang for joy because there was happiness there. Job, where were you when that happened? What's Job going to answer? He doesn't know. He doesn't know at all. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Verse 9, when I made the cloud the garment thereof and thick darkness a swaddling band for it and break up for it, my decree place. I chose my own place, Mount Zion, and set bars and doors, 11, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Set the sea coast, 12, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? Have you told it, son, come up? Job, did you do that? Can you? Do you see how small man is and how unlearned uh, compared to your father? All wisdom comes from our father, and if you don't listen to him, friend, you're soddish. And caused the day spring to know his place. Who put the time clock in its proper uh, sequence? 13. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that it could lighten and darken at whichever time, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Who has the power? Job, can you take the, the wicked one, is what it really says. Can you take hold of this earth and shake the wicked out? God said, I can. I've done it before. 14. It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. A garment for what? A garment for souls. Job, can you take the clay that was level and cause the images to come up from it? First, the man. Can you make a living being from the clay, Job? This is the potter talking to the clay, friend. You got it? And furthermore, Job, not only man, but do you see those images on the horizon, those trees? Can you make them come up, Job? Can you create seed? Need I go on? Our Father... Our Father is all-powerful. Poor old Job in chapter 40. I, I can never, I hope that each of you understand Job's place. Job answered in chapter 40. You're not going to have this, but listen to me. Then Job answered the Lord, and the Lord went on and on and showed Job how little man knows if you don't listen to your father. Behold, I am vile, Job says in verse 2 of chapter 40. What shall I answer thee? How can I answer that? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. I'll close my mouth and put my hand over it so I don't speak foolishly. 
Once have I spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. And then God answered the low Job, and he said, You girt yourself up and stand up like a man and stop whimpering before me. You see, you listen to man and you hear a lot of yakety, yakety, yakety. You study in your Father's Word and you go into the depth of the knowledge of the world that was this earth age and yes, the one that's coming. And the third chapter of Peter jumps to life from the very pages and becomes the living Word in your heart and mind and soul. And you begin to realize those three earth ages and why God had to put us in this earth age. And some he chose, yes, even before the foundation of this earth age because they stood against Satan in that first battle. As it is written in Romans chapter 8, they persevered. They were judged there. Therefore God, through the Comforter, can intercede in their lives because they don't even know what to pray for sometimes. But God utilizes his elect to fulfill his prophecy. Prophecy comes to pass exactly as it's written. And do you know why? God is in control and he controls his elect in specific points and places whereby that prophecy comes to pass exactly as it is written. Do you think that you listen to this lecture on the three world ages by accident, dear one? Do you that hear and understand? There would be some that would say, well, he's talking about reincarnation. No. You only go through this earth age one time. Anybody that tells you they are reincarnate or possessed of an evil spirit that possessed someone before and simply prattles on through the mouth of the idiot. Well, you're calling all those idiots that claim they're reincarnated. Yeah, that's, that's right. They are. Don't you agree? Anytime you'll let some demonic stay, stay within you, an evil spirit, and spout words unfriendly to you through your own mouth, pretty well speaks for itself. I don't think I have to make the decision. I think you can figure that out for yourself. Well, there are three worth ages. You must go through each one of them one time and one time only. That's an incorrect statement, and I will correct myself. You must, each will go through the first two one time and one time only. But only the overcomers will go through the third. Because inasmuch as God saw fit that he must kill Satan, and he pronounced a death sentence upon him, saw fit to give each one of those he had misled that opportunity to come through this earth age born of woman. A few refused to be and took woman for play pretty. Remember what happened to them. To make his or her mind up whether they would love God or Satan. And within this brought the Messiah to this earth in the flesh himself. He won't ask you to do something that he won't do himself. All the pain of it. As a matter of fact, he went one step further. He allowed himself to be nailed to that cross through the very palms of his hands. And he did not complain as the sheep led to slaughter. He could have backed out. He could have changed his mind. Many of you think, well, I, I would like to believe that, but I'm, I'm going to wait. I'll change my mind. Yeah. What would have happened if he had changed his mind on you? But he leads some, and he chooses some. But I believe, and don't ask me to document, this is a comment from me, from years of research. I believe one of the reasons that God came in that body of Messiah and died upon the cross is clearly stated in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. I came to this earth to be crucified whereby I can destroy Satan, the devil, which is death. In other words, I ask, what does it take to kill one of your own children? God saw fit to come here in the form of Messiah, to die at the hands of the Kenite, which is to say the offspring of Satan, Satan egging them on. They killed him, therefore the parable. The father sent the son to those that the field had been let out to, the vineyard rather, and they killed him to try to inherit. Satan wants to inherit. 
And now, inasmuch as Satan killed the body of God in Christ, in flesh, God won't have to worry too much. Or I imagine his conscience and his loving self will not feel so bad when he ducks Satan's curly locks under the burning brine in the lake of fire and those that choose to follow him. Bless your hearts. I hope you have understood this. I hope you've enjoyed it. Our Father's knowledge is written in His Word. It's up to you to ascertain that that you will that brings you peace of mind and understanding in the events that happen in this earth age and realize how important it is then that you serve Him. There's really nothing else that's quite as important. And the faithful love of our close-knit family with He being our Father that looks out for us and brings those blessings. Yes? If someone asks you again as a Christian, how old do you think this earth is? Don't say 6,000 years. Say eons. Millions of years. It's been documented. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, please.